I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah. Church, it's good to be together. Good to see you. Glad you are here. As we continue in our summer series, our Wednesday night summer series, we always are thankful for guests and visitors. So if this is your first time here or someone invited you or you heard Mitch was speaking and you said, I want to be there. And so you showed up tonight. We are thankful that you are here. We're looking at the names and titles of God in scripture to better capture and understand the essence of God as much as we can to try to understand the nature of God, the character of God, the heart of God, our Heavenly Father. And so as we look at the different names and titles of God in Scripture, we learn a little bit more about who He is. We get a glimpse into His character. And we, as we said a couple of weeks ago, being made in His image, in many ways get a glimpse into who He he created us to be as well. And so tonight we're looking at the title or the name El Roy, the God who sees. You know, we often take vision and seeing for granted. If you're like me, you do. And I don't even see that well, and I take it for granted. I read a story about two friends who went to a soccer game in Colombia. 
One of the friends was blind. The other could see. And you say, well, why would a blind person go to a soccer game? Well, they had devised a way for the blind person to actually see the game. You see, the blind friend would sit in front in the stands, and his seeing friend would sit behind him, and he would trace the movement of the ball on his blind friend's back. And that way, he knew where the ball was on the field. He knew what was happening. Now, I don't know what he did when there was a red card. Maybe he smacked him on the back of the head. I don't know. But I love that story because it helps us see how important seeing is and how important seeing for someone else can be. And just as seeing is important, being seen is incredibly important. And just like we take seeing and vision for granted, we take being seen for granted. Because the truth is, every single one of us wants to be seen. We want to be validated. We want to be acknowledged. We want to be noticed, especially by those who mean so much to us. And what do you think about God being the God who sees? That's what we're going to talk about tonight. To help us do that, we have Mitch Wilburn here. Many of us know Mitch. Many of you know him well. You maybe were in his youth group back in the day, or maybe you were from Park at some point, the Park Church of Christ in Tulsa. I feel like we have a strong connection, our two congregations, Edmund and the Park. Mitch has been the preaching minister there for a long time. Now, he will tell you that he is a native Texan, a transplanted Texan, but he's lived in Oklahoma for over 30 years, like 34, 35 years, and he told me tonight he has an OU shirt, and that's, so he's coming along, he's coming along, he does still have too much burnt orange, but we, we all have our flaws, we can pray for him about that, but Mitch has uh, degrees from ACU and OC, he has spoken all over the world, but what you really need to know about Mitch is he has a genuine passion for God and for the church and for bringing people closer to Christ and Christ-likeness. And if you have seen Mitch outside of this context, he's a powerful speaker. God uses him in a powerful way to do that. But if you've ever seen him outside the speaking context, you see that he is the real deal. He truly is always thinking about bringing people closer to Christ, about sharing the good news. He's married to his wife, Shannon. They have two grown children, and they have three grandchildren with one on the way, hopefully to arrive in August, so they're pretty excited about that. And tonight, he's going to help us better see the God who sees. Let me lead us in prayer. We'll have a couple more songs, and then Mitch will speak to us. Let's join together in prayer. Father God, you are are a loving, merciful, mighty Father, our Father. And God, as we tonight explore part of your nature, part of your character, that you are the God who actually sees us. We struggle with the fact that you can, you have the ability to see all of us, but it's more than that, God, you choose to see us. You choose to acknowledge us, to validate us, to see us where we are, even when we are at our worst, Father, you see us not for what we have been, not for what we do that dishonors you, but you see us as you created us. And Father, we're thankful because we know that means we are the recipients of your mercy and grace and your love. And Father, we pray that you would speak through Mitch as you always do. Tonight as we listen, we pray that you would help us to be people who are not only seen, but who go into this world seeing others, truly seeing them. We praise your name as we continue our worship together. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be standing. <clears throat> Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the Son said. Yes, I am free. 
me at last, he has ransomed me, his grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me.
of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. Please be seated. What a blessing it is to be here with this Edmund family. Uh, Randy said it right, uh, that our churches share a great deal in common. I, I really believe that if you swapped signs, the Park Church and the Edmund Church, uh, you wouldn't know the difference. This is just a very, very similar family in spirit and size and in every way. And so I love you guys dearly. Uh, we have many members that when they leave the Edmond area and move to Tulsa, they land at Park. And the same is true when they move from Tulsa to Edmond. I know that Mark and Kathy Courtright send their warmest regards. I see them every Sunday as I'm standing up in the pulpit. They have their pew. I know where they are on my right. And so, uh, and then Mr. Michael Reese. Uh, Jeremy and Ashley Robertson grew up in my youth group. Uh, I see Todd Frazier here tonight. Uh, Todd was, uh, I guess I've known Todd, one of your deacons now, for 37, 38 years. Uh, one of my interns back at Park. And then, of course, every time that I'm around Mr. Roper, I am reminded how blessed this church is uh, with the leadership, with the preaching you have here, uh, and, boy, what he talks about. Uh, on stage is what he lives out in his life. And so it is an enormous blessing for me to be here with you guys tonight. Uh, if you have your Bibles, be turning to the Gospel of John uh, chapter 9. We'll start off there before we get to some passages in Genesis. And uh, as we talk about the God who sees, a lot of times that is most comforting when the world doesn't see us anymore. And isn't that powerful and touching and good news in every way? You know, if I'm on top of the mountain and the world sees me uh, and God sees me, boy, that's a wonderful thing. But if I have been discarded, I have been passed up as those early first century Christians were being looked over, looked past, or looked upon with great reproach and to be reminded, and not just first century Christians, but God followers throughout the entire Bible, to know that God sees them when no one else does. There, there's a gentleman, before I get to uh, the word of the Lord, his name is Jia Zhang. Jia Zhang. And Jia Zhang uh, has a blog and a podcast. I don't know if you've caught up with this guy yet, but uh, he is studying the concept of rejection what it is to be rejected, how to react when you are rejected. And so to really get into this, he took on the task of a hundred days of rejection, something that uh, I have done before unintentionally, but, but he tried to for a hundred days be rejected to see what that did. And so let me just give some of you some ideas if you ever want to learn what it is to be rejected. Uh, day one, borrow a hundred dollars from a stranger. So that's what he did. He walked around his city trying to borrow $100 off of a stranger. How many times do you think you'd be rejected? Day two, request a burger refill. Now some of you are going, I might try that. You, you know there's free refills that, with the Diet Coke, but have you ever gone up and said, I'll take a burger refill. All right, so uh, uh, day six, play soccer in someone's backyard that you don't know. Excuse me, I'd like to play soccer in your backyard. No, you can go right on. Rejection accomplished. Uh, day seven, speak over Costco's intercom. Some of my other favorites. Uh, day 15, request to be a live mannequin at Abercrombie and Fitch. <laughs> okay. Uh, day 18, give weather forecast on live TV. No, you can't do that. <laughs> day 19, make announcement on a Southwest flight. Day 21, ask strangers for compliments. <laughs> I just walk around. What do you like about me? Some of you need to try this next one. Day 22 at Brahms tonight. Uh, get, quote, unquote, the Thai torture flavor ice cream at Brahms. They don't have that. You're going to be rejected. But keep asking for it. Uh, on and on it goes. Make my own sandwich at Subway. Uh, attend a random Super Bowl party, 
go to a fish restaurant and buy one quarter of shrimp, or at least ask for that. Uh, day 68, ask to exchange secrets with total strangers. And the one, uh, Rejection Day 82, go to uh, the Lincoln Memorial in Washington and ask the park rangers if you can sit on Lincoln's lap. And so on and on it goes. And uh, I'm sorry for those of you I've given you ideas that your spouse didn't need to have those ideas. What is it when the world rejects you, doesn't see you, and yet in that rejection and in that space of being lonely, Alone is okay. Lonely is not okay. In your loneliness, knowing that a God, a good shepherd, sees you. So, John 9, beginning in verse 1. As Jesus went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus responded, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the works of God might, de- might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, Jesus spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. Siloam means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. As we look at that story, let me give you three truths about a God who sees. Number one, first truth is a promise. God sees you. God sees us. And for you, you need to understand and be able to say to yourself that God sees me. As Jesus went along that day, what did the rest of the world see? Well, if you read one more verse than we read, the neighbors get in a debate. Isn't this blind man now seeing the same beggar? And they debated on if he were the beggar or not. The neighbors just saw a beggar. If you go home far enough tonight in Oklahoma City, you can pass by an intersection where many people will see someone holding a sign panhandling, as we call it, and our world will see a beggar. That's what the neighbors saw in this man. They saw a beggar. What did the disciples see? Well, Jesus' disciples, of course, they're going to see much more than that. No, in fact, they see something much worse than that. They don't even see a person. They see a theological debate. Well, Jesus, what we really like to do now is talk to you about who sinned. Was it him or was it his parents? Let's not even talk about the person. Let's talk about the past, the perspective of the problem. Oh, those people around see a beggar. No, we don't even see a beggar. We just see something to come and beg you, Jesus. Would you implore, would you explore with us now this theological question? The Pharisees, the religious establishment, if you continue reading in the story, well, guess what day this healing took place on? The Sabbath. And so they don't see a neighbor. They don't see a theological debate. They see a problem. Who did this? Because we know no one of God would be about helping this man in this way. And this problem has to be gotten to the bottom of. And there are so many times in our culture that we can miss it and see the wrong things. God's word that we read moments ago said this. As Jesus went along, he saw a man. He saw a person. He saw a person who didn't cry out, who couldn't even see to cry out. And in light of that, we're not sure that he even knew, since he's not crying out, who was passing by. He does not see Jesus. It is Jesus who sees him. And Jesus, without being asked, comes and offers this undeserved, unrequested act of kindness and begins to, through his sight of the man, As the Word of God says, Jesus going along saw the man begins to act in a way that is 100% grace. Ephesians 2 and 8, for it is by God's grace that we have been gifted, that we have been saved. God sees you when you're losing hope. 
God sees you when the marriage is in trouble. God sees you when the children that you have invested your lives in, whether they're in your home or out of your home, are acting in ways that causes you. I remember my aunt and raising one of my cousins. My cousin was not living his life at the age of 30 in some ways that was giving my aunt great reason to be proud. And I went to my aunt Carolyn and I said, Aunt Carolyn, he, he's 35. And she just looked at me and she said, Mitch is from womb to tomb. You never stop caring. That's my boy. God sees you in that place where that person whom you love, you're hurting for. He sees you in your health crisis. He sees you when the bills are mounting and the money that needs to go out is exceeding the money that is coming in. God sees you, the person, the child in that place. This story, to Randy's point, feeds upon and is founded upon, if you would, in your Bibles, turn to Genesis 16. All stories of a God who sees come from a place where God reveals one of his names. And again, just to impress upon you the, the beauty and the wisdom of the topic of the summer series, whenever I go and visit hospitals, and we have a member who is in a moment of massive health crisis, one of the things I love to share with them is I say, now our God does all things well, all things well, Amen and amen. Never has a statement been made that is more uh, under the bar than has ever been said. I mean, he does all things excellent. But isn't it interesting that there are some things that God does where he says they are his name. They are foundational to who he is. And so in those hospitals, I love to tell people, God says he is Jehovah Rophe. He doesn't just kind of heal God our healer as a side gig. It is foundational to who he is. Tonight, in Genesis 16, we get to one of these things that is not a side gig. It is foundational to his character at a level where he says, this is my name. And so we are going to read a little bit of a lengthy passage of text to set the context Genesis, 6, Genesis 16 and 1. Now Sarai, Abraham, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, uh, the Lord has kept me from having children. Uh, this whole faith thing, maybe God needs a little bit of help. We've got this promise, but nothing's happening. So how about I insert this idea? Uh, go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarah said. So after Abram uh, had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarah, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar, gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarah said to Abram, you're responsible for this. What did what, what, you do here, Abram? Uh, I'm responsible for your suffering. Yeah, I put my slave into your arms, and now she knows she is pregnant. She despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your slave is now in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was a spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he came and said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to be counted. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael for the Lord has heard of your misery. He'll be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility toward all of his brothers. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one, capital O, one who sees me. Boy, note the order there. 
He sees me, then I see him. He first loved us, and then we love him. There's an order to that. That is why the well is called Bir Laharoi. It is still there between Kadesh and Bered. The God who sees me, sees you, sees us. Truth number two, not just a promise, but a perspective. My circumstances are not about, my circumstances are not about, this is a word for you, and perhaps you know a friend, this is to be a word through you. Boy, God's just punishing me. God's just abandoning me. My circumstances are not about punishment. They're not about past choices or even problems. And the stories we have just read, they may have come from that. But they are in God's hands. They are platforms for his glory. What's John 9 say? Jesus, this happened so that the works, the glory of God might be displayed in him. Well, no, no, no. His blindness happened for another reason. We know it's physiological. Jesus, his words, this happened. It's kind of a hard one to get around. This happened. God working in it so that the glory of the Lord may be shown. Genesis 16, some of these relationships we're reading, some of these thought processes between a husband and a wife. How about you do this? And how about a child comes about this way? We read that and we cringe. It's ugly. It's unfaithful. It's not the plan of God. Do we see a God going, couldn't have seen this one coming. In fact, now that it has happened, I can't do anything with it. Who would have ever thought you guys would have gone this far offline? Hoop, you stumped me. Or is this a God who begins to step in, begins to redeem, and even in that redemption, in the midst of unfaithfulness, all things not done in faith are sin, not only redeems but reveals his name and character in a way that otherwise would not have come through this platform. What would happen if we began to view our lives as not things and began to speak of things that are not punishment from the Lord, that are not just past choices that we're called to live in, but instead learn from, surrender in the midst of and afterwards and give it to God, and he begins to work through those things. In the Bible, these two stories we've read, we've read about blindness and we've read about barrenness. We've read about loneliness. We've read about singleness. And God in all of that stepping in and doing what only God can. How do we continue to keep our eyes on this one that has his eyes on us? A few years back, um, the park, uh, Mary in Tulsa, our youth ministry produces a young man who had become one of the leading drum majors for the OU Sooners, Sooner Marching Band. And as he is uh, working his way up to being the, the head drum major, one day we go out and witness, I mean, this incredible, incredible, massive band fill the field. And I never really watched the drum majors before. I'd, sometimes, I, no offense here, I kind of haven't watched a lot of the marching bands before. I, I go for the football game. That's my time to go get snacks. Appreciate all that they do. But, but now I am not going for the football game. I'm going to watch the marching band. And one thing I notice that happens when OU does their marching band thing, this is a, a no-duh moment for all those who are parents and those who have participated in marching bands. For me, it was new. And even at my high school, where we only had 50 kids in the marching band, this, this was new. The OU Sooner Band is so big that the major drum major, the, the head honcho, that's the official term, head honcho, he's doing his thing. And right now someone's going, Mitch, that's not what he does. But you get my point. He's doing his thing. And the fact that they are all moving means that at a certain time, each band member, as he's doing his thing here, a band member is facing this way. He's back here doing his cadence, and this guy is marching this way. There are two other drum majors on the sides in the end zones. They are also doing their thing. But you know which way they're looking? 
the entire time they're looking at the head drum major. Their eyes are on him. And our perspective, no matter where we are in whatever problem, whatever thing that we used to view as a punishment, our new perspective is that it is a platform that God is directing us into line with his movement and his steps. And the church's job is to give that same cadence of our lives as we keep our eyes on the Lord. None of it being, a well, this is how you live. No, all of it is, by grace we have been saved. And as Paul would say, follow me as I follow him. And the only way I am able to reflect to you anything you are to be about is because my eyes are completely on the Lord. What are your current circumstances that you can begin to view as not problems or anything other than a platform to begin to give God glory? I hadn't planned to share this one, but it's, it enters my mind at this moment. Uh, one of my dearest, dearest friends uh, passed from this life December 1st of 2019. And I, I, many of you I know his story. I've probably shared his story before. His name was Alan Trimble. He was the head coach of the Jinx Trojans. He had more state championship rings than he had fingers on his hand. His most profound days of exalting Christ came when he could not exalt himself. And I don't say that any other way than literally. He could not exalt himself out of a chair due to Lou Gehrig's disease. But yet in the midst of his problem, he used that as a platform to say, follow the one that I am following. And the city of Tulsa, a million people in the metro area, watch this man at a level that at his funeral, he wanted to have it at our church and we couldn't have it there. But we had to rent out the Maybe Center at Oral Roberts University because we needed a venue that would hold thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people as they came to witness this man who had lived for Christ. Number three, truth. We've talked about the perspective and the promise. Let's talk about the process. Don't let the recipe keep you from the reward. Don't let the path God is going to take you to that platform keep you from going there. You go, now Mitch, where are you getting this out of Scripture? <laughs> uh, hey, gentlemen, I want to heal you. And the next thing he hears is Jesus going, Phew. <laughs> uh, what was that, Jesus? One moment. Hey, what's he doing? You don't want to know. <laughs> no, no, I'm blind. Tell me what he's doing. I have an idea now what he's doing. And Jesus has a weird recipe for what his redemption is going to look like. I wonder if that's the same truth for someone in your life, if it's the same truth for you. God's ways are not our ways. And the process can kind of be at times something, and many times it's something we would have never, never recognized. Don't let messy, don't let the direction or his method keep you from being delivered to his miracle. So what does that look like for you? Let me get real for a moment. In your relationships, do you have a relationship now that you're awkward with somebody? I really don't have many enemies. I don't know if I have any enemies. There's not, not a lot of us that attend church on Wednesday nights. I have a list at my house of enemies. I keep it on my refrigerator. A lot of you are going, no, no, I don't have one enemy. Somebody in this room is going, yeah, I got an enemy. You didn't pick the fight. They're coming at you. But all of us kind of have that list. Of, yeah, yeah, there's someone it's awkward with. There's a neighbor, there's a sibling, there's a, there's a parent, there's an ex. And the Lord says in your heart and in his word, go apologize. I'm not going through that messy kind of recipe for redemption. Apologize when they apologize to me. And the Lord said, no, 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 no. You go. 
you go love as I've loved you. A little while ago, we sang a song about he loved us while we were still enemies. It's one thing to sing that in the church house. It's another thing to live that out in the real house. Well, I don't want to do that. No, I'm trying to put some flesh on this process thing now. Don't let the messy recipe keep you from the reward. There are so many relationships that have been redeemed because somebody said, I'll be humble and I'll go and I'll say, I'm sorry. And maybe that, and I'm waiting for the warm fuzzies and wow, this really is messy. It didn't even get redeemed after I said, I'm sorry. But the Lord says, I'm in this and I'm still working and I'm still moving and you continue to be faithful and let me worry about the fruit that comes from that. You just be obedient. What does it look like when we continue to have faith in the recipe? Maybe it's a confession. Now, now we're kind of getting a little bit more real. And what, what's the Bible say? Confess your sins one to another so that I may bring healing. Well, I confess my sins to God for forgiveness. And the Bible, though, says, yeah, you confess your sins to God for forgiveness, but you confess your sins one to another for healing. We got churches full of people who are forgiven, but they're not healed. Well, I don't want to confess my sins. Well, then I guess you don't want to be healed. Uh, well, no, I don't. Confess your sins to one another so that you may be, say it with me, healed. That's the Word of God. Oh, well, Mitch, that's messy. Don't let the recipe and the process keep you from the reward. So, with mud and spit on his eyes, don't wipe it off, don't wipe it off. It's kind of the explicit and implicit thing. Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. How is God sending you from this evening? If you were to pray to the Holy Spirit, God, tonight, and say, God, how would you send me from this place to see things new? How do I need to go and wash and be washed in your word at a level where I hear and obey, where you bring about a reward and a recipe for redemption in my life? How, how does that sending look for you? If you've got your Bibles, turn back to John 9. And this will, will be done. Well, I've loved being with you guys. As we continue to read this story, the Pharisees get involved. They, they bring him in. It kind of begins in verse 13. Tell us who did this. Bring his parents in here. You, is this your son? Yeah, it's her son. Was he born blind? Yeah, he's born blind. How'd this happen? This is because of fear. They said, well, I don't want to be kicked out of the synagogue. He's of age, ask him. So not even a respectable thing. Our son's a grown man, you can ask him. Out of fear. And so they ask him again. And, you know, I love his confession. I, I, he said, I don't know this or that. I don't even know who it was. But this thing I know. I was blind, but now I... See. So he confesses what he knows. In verse 35, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when Jesus found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believed and he worshiped him. There's a pattern. A lot of times we, boy, and it's a great, great thing to want to do. I want to see God, and I want to make him seen in my life. A little bit out of order. This story says it begins with God seeing you knowing that by grace, when you were alone in that desert place, kicked out and mistreated and done, an enemy of the Lord, he saw you, began the process of redeeming you. He sees you. It is then, in what we just read, tell me who he is, Jesus. 
the one who speaks with you, that's, that's who he is. The man falls down and in that spot begins to worship. When you fall down in a public place and begin to worship, what you are saying to everyone in your presence, see him. Romans 12, living sacrifice. This is your true worship. The order is, he sees us, we see him, and then we make him seen. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Almighty God, loving Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to encounter your word, Genesis and John, and all throughout Scripture, Lord, where uh, you, you see us, Father. Uh, you see us, you begin to call us, you love us, and, and Father, love us enough that you just don't see us where we are. You help us to see where you see we can go and begin to call us to that. And then, Father, we begin to have the greatest gift ever in partnering with you and your spirit, empowered by your spirit, to help the world see you as well. Father, we pray that uh, in the process of, of seeing you and making you seen, of being obedient, of uh, confessing, admitting, apologizing, obeying, whatever that may be, Father, that uh, we would continue to trust in you, our sustainer, redeemer, and the transform, transforming power in our lives, Father, to bring to completion what you have started. Father, please be with me unto this end. Lord, you know that I need this, and I pray that anyone like me, a, a sinner who has been in this room tonight that can come along for the ride as well, Father, will humbly say, Lord, uh, move in us and through us that you may be seen by all. It is in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Thank you so much, Mitch, for sharing those insights from Scripture. Thank you for reminding us that God truly does see us and the significance of that truth that he sees us. I know you've been blessed by being here. Thank you for being here tonight. Next week, David Duncan will be with us speaking on Abba Father. That will be really good. And so I invite you back next week at 7 o'clock right here. Bring someone with you. And just like you were blessed tonight, think about someone who can be blessed by hearing that message next week. And so invite someone to be with you. And if, again, if you are our guest tonight, we're so thankful that you are here. We have a cookie fellowship right out here in just a moment. So we invite everyone to be a part of the cookie fellowship in the quad area. Just go through those doors that direction. Lots of cookies out there. So enjoy some time together. Have a blessed rest of the week. Glad you're here. Go with God. You're dismissed.